Well, if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to the letter to the Philippians, chapter 4. going to be reading from verse 4 to verse 9. Listen to this. This is the word of God. Let's stand together. <clears throat> rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard <clears throat> your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent, excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Let's pray together. Help us now, Lord. Illuminate your word. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Teach us and feed us your word that we might grow in the image of Christ and worship him. And we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. <clears throat> what American days we are living in. Nightly reports of rioting in major cities, which is a plug for living in small towns. <laughs> a global pandemic we all had hoped would be almost gone in four months of national, economic, scholastic, and personal discomfort. Churches closed, hymn singing ruled out in some parts of the country, defenders shot, and looters applauded. Disunity, division, and despising of what truly made America great. Not the Great Depression or the Great War, but maybe something worse. The erosion of confidence in America and God's hand upon it. Maybe the Corona plague has been sent from the Lord to punish our national sins. And the chariots of fire are circling in God's Shekinah glory for departure over a once great nation of faith. What is the remaining church to do? What are we as Christians to do in this dark hour? I'm reminded of an earthly hero of mine, Winston Churchill, whose heroic acts of leadership were featured recently in a movie titled the darkest hour, when the bulk of the British and French armies were cornered on a little strip called Dunkirk on the coast of France, everything representing what stood between Nazi Germany and the rest of the world. He went to Parliament and delivered a now famous speech in, in June of 1940 where he stated the strategy for facing darkness. We shall fight on the beaches and the fields and the roadways and the cities. We shall never give up. We shall never surrender. We serve a warrior God. We serve a warrior God and Savior who never gave up. All the way to the cross. He never gave up. <clears throat> Can we do less? Can we do less? But... How shall we fight? What are the weapons of the kingdom that we are to combat, do combat on planet Earth? A few are listed here today in the passage that I read. And so we're going to list those and unfold. And the first, of course, rejoice. Rejoice. 
probably haven't thought of that as a weapon of the kingdom, but it is. Uh, in her later years, my grandmother Barry referred to by her friends and family as Midge, which was short for Mildred. <laughs> not, not a name we hear m much today. But in her later years, uh, she became very critical uh, about everything and everyone. Uh, it was a sickness that she couldn't shake, and you could only endure it on short visits to her retirement home or nursing home. And there was so much, of course, to complain about with the death of her husband, the aging process, the loneliness, the isolation, the faults and failures of her only daughter, and the lack of attention from her grandchildren. Uh, I suppose I have my grandmother to blame when my wife <clears throat> reminds me of my critical and complaining <laughs> spirit. Uh, but I have a remedy, right? When I return to my default position of complaining, I have a remedy that the Lord has given me, and that is to rejoice and count my blessings, right? Yeah. Psalm 103, I love it, has that beautiful line at the beginning, uh, <clears throat> forget not all his benefits, who heals your diseases and renews your life from the pit, who crowns you with glory. Remembering the blessings. Here's Paul, uh, as written about in Acts chapter 16, in Philippi, in prison. And what's he doing? What would any of us be doing? Complaining about being in prison. <laughs> How unjustly we were in prison. Uh, uh, how we should be out. How we're innocent. We'd be complaining. What's Paul and Silas doing? They're singing hymns. What? See, I remember I first read that uh, as a young Christian. What? That would be the last thing I'd be. Singing hymns. Because they could. Because they could rejoice. Because of Christ and the gospel. Christians are enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit to remember what is always there. And to focus on. It's like the stars, which are always there right now. You go outside during the day, of course, you can't see any stars. But when the sun goes down and you look up, wow, they're there. And they never, they never left. They were always there. Christians can remember the benefits of God and, by, by the, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit, can focus on it. <clears throat> to remember the Lord's goodness in creation grace in salvation, and love in provision of family, marriage, home, work, friendship, health. We have so many blessings to focus on and to count. The fruit of the Spirit, we're told in Galatians 5, 22, is what? Love, joy. Ah, there's number two. Love, joy. After the death of half their number, the Mayflower Pilgrims, half their number the first winter, I think they came with 102, so they're down to 55 after the first winter. And you know what they do? They complain and say, wow, we really thought God was with us. We're going back to England. No, they had a worship service. Worship service. To praise God for all that he had done for them. Bringing them safely over the ocean and planting them there in, in the new world. They worshipped him. How is that possible? When half of the people they came with died over the winter. The Spirit of God enables joy. Enables us to rejoice. At the funeral of my father-in-law just a few months ago. At any funeral of any loved Christian, how can you rejoice? Which we did. How, how could we rejoice? Because we could rejoice that he had run the race God had marked out for him. That he had been a, a faithful husband, father, and businessman, pastor, evangelist. We, we could rejoice in all of that. We rejoiced in his life. 
even in the midst of sorrow of death. <clears throat> the spiritual giants of my Christian pilgrimage are almost all home now. Uh, J.I. Packer uh, died 93 uh, a week or two ago out in Vancouver. Uh, I remember my early Christian days reading Knowing God, foundational. Uh, <laughs> millions of us Christians read Knowing God, gave us our first uh, theological understanding about what it, what it meant to, to know this uh, invisible God. Uh, Ravi Zacharias, a month or two ago, great apologist, Indian born. I mean, he was a hero of mine. I, I served as an RUF campus minister for six years at UNC Asheville. Um, I tried to get Ravi to come to our university every year, but couldn't do it. But he was there at Oxford and Harvard and other places uh, carrying the banner of Christianity. He had a photographic memory. It was impressive. He could, he could recall passages from books and scripture. And you just, when you heard him, you, you felt like, wow, so glad he's on our team. <laughs> this is brilliant. And, uh, but he's gone now. He's home with the Lord. R.C. Sproul uh, last year. Uh, Chuck Colson two years ago. These were giants for me. Um, and, and they're gone. There's a lot that we could be sorrowful about. Um, like when Moses passed and Israel wondered what's next. Um, but we can rejoice. We can rejoice in how God used them in the season that they were here upon the earth, how they affected our lives personally, how they uh, increased the church, bless the church, strengthen the church, how God is going to fill and is already filling their shoes with, with new believers. In the face of their Lord on the cross, here are the disciples at the time probably thinking, oh, this is it. It, it failed. Uh, we, we thought he was going to be a shepherd and our king, and here he is. He's died. Sorrow. They're in the upper room. They're afraid. And yet, in time, they're able to do what? To rejoice and to spread throughout the known world, rejoicing, even though their, their, their Savior, their friend, had died. Uh, in sorrow, the believer has the spirit which enables them to rejoice, even though there's so many things to complain about uh, and worry and fret about. So what about the current state of our nation now, current state of our culture? I think we could all agree we've never seen anything like where we're going right now. I mean, we all, well, not all of us, but many of us lived through 9-11. We thought, wow, we've never seen this. Uh, but a global pan pandemic uh, that's affecting not just New York City and one a, a state here and there, but the whole world um, in this current state. And then we have the racial tensions, which have bubbled up. Um, the racial tensions especially, there seems to be an inordinate amount of focus on division, focus on um, how we're against, focus on what's not been done. Um, how, how we failed, uh, of course, a reach back to centuries uh, ago to say, you know, <clears throat> failures here and to unearth, uh, you know, our sins from the past instead of rejoicing in what has been done. Rejoicing. I told a, a friend last night at dinner, I said, by God's grace, this nation's made incredible strides since 1960. We don't look anything like 1960. My children go to school with black friends. We have black friends neighbor. We, we, we're so integrated and we don't even think about it. I said that wasn't 1960. No, I understand that's not everybody's experience. I understand there's a, you know, especially the inner cities are, you know, different segments, but let's rejoice. Let, let, let's rejoice in what God has done. Let's work on what we need to do to, to continue that progress. Let, let's address injustices that are there. But we choose what to focus on. We can rejoice or we can complain. And we can point out all of the things that are wrong and uh, forget about all that God has done. Psalm 133 says this, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. 
It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collars of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore. <clears throat> Rejoice in unity. Unity. Rejoice. If you find that you aren't able to rejoice, if you find that you can't rejoice, it may be because the Holy Spirit is not in you to enable you to do that because you've never really received Christ as Savior and Lord. But today you can. If you're here and you haven't, you can receive Christ, realizing that he who did not spare his own son but gave him up freely for our salvation. If you want a new heart, that can rejoice today is the day that it can happen. You can receive Christ as Savior and Lord by confessing your sins and giving your life to him. And the Spirit comes in and enables you to rejoice. Amen? Amen. Well, that's the first weapon, rejoicing, rejoicing. Uh, the second is, of course, to pray. Prayer remains one of the most basic elements of Christian maturity, to turn to prayer when you are anxious and afraid. Uh, in my household, uh, uh, we, we pray for everything, um, and <clears throat> especially when we lose things, like car keys, <laughs> right? I've taught my kids uh, when we lose car keys or can't find glasses, we, we, we're, we start to get anxious, can't find it, where is it, I thought it was it, uh, no, oh, did I leave it, uh, and, okay, let's just stop and pray, and my kids can testify this morning, every time we do that, we find them, right, every time, and I even got rebuked by my, my youngest recently, <laughs> we were on a vacation, and I was getting angry and angry about the cargo carrier that would not close, <laughs> Uh, was too too full of things and it wouldn't close. And my my youngest son saw I was getting angry and he turned and said, "Dad, let's just stop and pray." <laughs> okay, Lord, let the little children lead them. Here we are. Wow. Amen. But Jesus prayed. God on earth prayed, right? Before the day began, Mark. 135, very early in the morning, Jesus got up and went to a solitary place and prayed. If we could teach our young people, now those of us, you know, who are, uh, as my brother says, on the back nine of life, uh, we know about getting up early and praying. If we could teach our young people to do that, to, to begin the day with prayer uh, as preparation for what is to come. <clears throat> Wow, what, a, what an achievement of discipleship. Um, you can bet I'm working on that. But <clears throat> uh, Before the day began, he prayed. Before he made big decisions, he prayed. <clears throat> Luke uh, chapter 6, verse 12, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. And when the morning came, he called his disciples to him, and he chose the 12, which should be the 12 apostles. He prayed in preparation of that. Before departure to heaven, John 17, 1, he looked to heaven and he prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Praying in preparation for protection, for leading. So if the second person of the Trinity needed or wanted to pray while on earth, how about me and you? Is that not something we can do? I, I really appreciate your prayer. Fred, <clears throat> uh, you can't teach, you can't teach people to pray with their heart. You just can't do it. Um, people will preach theologically with their head, with what they know, but you just can't, can't teach someone how to engage in prayer with the Lord and their own heart. You, you, we all should be doing it, but you can't teach that. And that's, it's a, a wonderful thing. Prayer acts on faith, recognizing dependence. Prayer acts on faith, recognizing dependence. If you're not praying, I can tell you that one of the reasons why you're not praying without ceasing throughout the day is because 
You either don't realize how dependent you are on God or you don't want to be that dependent. Okay? But but if you, you trust the Lord, you realize you're dependent, you're praying. The, the, the believer believes in God's presence. Jesus knew his Father was there. Knew it. Not a question of, gee, I hope you're there. He knew he was there. See, that's what faith. Faith just knows the Lord is there. He's everywhere. No matter where I am, he, he's there. As, as David said, uh, uh, Psalm say 139, but where he says, if I go up in the, the mountains, you're there. If I go to the depths of the sea, you're there. You, you just got to know that. No matter, you're in a foreign country, he's there. Um, you, faith believes that. Faith believes in God's power. Jesus believed my father can resurrect me. He has the power to resurrect me. There were, I, I can drink the cup because I know, I trust, 100%, he has the power to do this. The Lord calls you to do something. Faith says he, he can accomplish that. I don't know how, but he can. Believes in his presence and his power and believes in his character. Jesus believed that his father would resurrect him. It's one thing to believe someone can. It's another thing to believe they would. That they are good. Okay? Not like these other gods uh, from other religions. You're not really sure. But God's character is that he's good and he's loving and he's for us. You can trust that. And you can pray for that. So prayer is a defense. Paul says, be anxious for nothing. Okay? The defense I don't want to be anxious. I'm afraid of what's coming tomorrow. I'm afraid of my state of my health, state of other people's health, uh, economic. Gosh, we have so much right now under COVID to worry about, right? Economically, it's like day in and day out. You know, it's one more night of rioting in Portland. And um, so prayer is be anxious for nothing. Here's, here's a way that it's defensive. Okay. With thanksgiving, present your requests, and the peace that passes understanding will guard your heart. Guard. So you're praying that you might be guarded. You're, you're not oblivious to the problems out there, <clears throat> but you're praying to be guarded. But then prayer is also a weapon. <clears throat> I heard someone years ago use the illustration of prayer is like uh, a weapon. It's like in the military calling for an airstrike. Okay, uh, you remember any movie that you may have seen where the soldiers are pinned down? Uh, they do this today in the Middle East, in Afghanistan uh, or Iraq. They were pinned down and they'd call in for an airstrike and a plane would come in and they had a location. So they had to depend on, you know, someone in the sky. They called in for the airstrike. That's the offensive weapon. And so we pray, Paul says, Colossians 4.3, pray for us that a door may be open for us to share the gospel. Okay? That's offensive. All right? I'm praying that God would open ways for, for me to speak to neighbors or, or family. Um, pray for ways, uh, you know, for people in, in the public sphere to, to <clears throat> proclaim the gospel. Fred brought one up about uh, the player in the NFL who said only kneels for Christ. Uh, I saw another one. You know, this young kid out in Western Carolina who won the congressional seat, or maybe won the primary, he hadn't gotten the seat yet, but he won the Republican primary to replace Mark Meadows. He's, and he's, uh, <clears throat> the Constitution says you have to be 25 to be in the House of Representatives, right? Is it 25? Yeah. And he's only 24. <laughs> but he's going to turn 25 in a month or two. Um, so there's a little clip on the news that I saw. He went to, he went to Washington. He, he met... Uh, President Trump and, and some of the other uh, Republican leaders. And in the midst of that, he talked, uh, he was asked, uh, you know, about what he wanted to do. And he said, um, I want, uh, the Lord has called me to do this and I want to be used by God. So, you know, praying for our leaders to have that kind of vision. James 5.13 says, uh, is any one of you in trouble? He should pray offensively you're praying for deliverance we're praying for people to be delivered from from problems okay uh james 5 16 confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you might be healed okay we did all this in our, our prayer today that's we should be 
praying for healing. That's offensive. Lord, go in there. Heal. Give the doctors wisdom. Give them skill. Gosh, I could, could tell you many stories about in, in pastoral ministry doing that and seeing the Lord um, uh, do things that the doctors come out and say, I, I don't know how it happened. <laughs> the cancer's not there anymore. I don't know how it happened. Yeah, the Lord went in there. Ephesians 6, 18, uh, Scripture says, Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Prayer is breathing for the Christian. It's breathing. You, you, you do it throughout the day because there's so many things to pray about. Uh, as you go through the day. And we need to get into the habit of before we send that email that we're frustrated to our coworker about. <laughs> and I've done that. Stop and pray. Okay? Um, uh, pray for the news story before tweeting out something about it. Uh, we need to pray before we do things and say things. Uh, the Confederate General Stonewall Jackson was a very intentional Christian, um, was mocked for it uh, by some uh, in, in, in the army, uh, but uh, you know, the Lord led him and, and strengthened him in a lot of ways before he ever sent a letter in a time of uh, no, no emailing and texting. There were a lot of letters that were written. And, uh, but before ever he sent a letter, he prayed. He prayed for the sender. He prayed for the recipient. He prayed that they you know, would receive it well, um, bathing in a prayer. Uh, prayer is an offensive, defensive weapon for the kingdom, as is rejoicing. Our, our third and last one uh, this morning is thinking. Thinking. Who would have thought? Thinking. Let my people think. I heard uh, one day. Ravi Zacharias, the apologist's title for his uh, newsletter, Let My People Think. Uh, I thought, oh, I wish I'd thought of that. <laughs> that was so good. Salvation affects thinking. The Christian life is not about uh, a set of rituals that we do. We, we come and gather on a Sunday, read the Bible, we pray. Um, before meals. That's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is a relationship between the God of the universe and us as, a, as, as his creation. Um, it's a relationship. And when we are saved, when we receive Christ, he gives us his spirit and begins to change our thinking. Okay? And as we grow we read the word of God, which Paul says in Romans, uh, that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So we, we're always, you know, at 55, I'm 25, 30 years down the road as a Christian. My thinking now is more clear than ever before about who God is and what he's called us to do. Um, younger Christians... And as, when I was a younger Christian, you know, I, I was thinking the world's thoughts after, right? I was thinking uh, like the world. But, but, but our thinking is effective. We are called to intentional thinking. 2 Corinthians 10.5 uh, is a passage likely written above the entrance door to many Christian high schools and colleges. It says, take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. Because as the proverb says, as a man thinks, so is he. So we have to take every thought captive, right? The things we hear. I mean, my kids are listening and watching things all the time. Are they taking it captive? Or is it having an impression leading them to think in a different way? The fruit of discipline, part of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, where di discipline will allow you to fix your eyes and thoughts on certain subjects without being distracted. Because that's what the world does. That's what Satan does through the world. Distracts us. Instead of fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, right? Hebrews 12. 
We don't have a fix. We're not. We're distracted. We're looking over here. Okay, and we're believing this now, even though. Oh, okay. What did you say, Lord? We have to focus. Thinking as a defense. Paul writes, focus on whatever is good, true, admirable, praiseworthy. We we have we have a choice. Just like with rejoicing or praying, we have a choice. We can think about this, or we can think about this. Okay? Are we feeding our mind with uh, scripture, with programs, with books that are leading us to think about the Lord, good, right, or are we feeding our mind and heart? I mean, that's, I mean, that's just where we live, grassroots level, as, as a family with kids, grandkids, right? I mean, I know it is for everybody, but especially uh, trying to separate out living in the world but not being of it. Thinking as offense, Richard Weaver in 1948 wrote a book called Ideas Have, Have Consequences because he was concerned about what was happening in the church among Christians, uh, the, the thinking of different directions about socialism uh, and some other uh, bigger political ideas. Uh, so, he, so he wrote the book about liberalism that was, that was getting into the church. We have to intentionally think God's thoughts after him, right? Reading scripture, this is why reading scripture is so vital and foundational for the Christian. Um, I once had a guy, uh, not, a, not a believer, ask me, well, why, you, why are the Christians so, um, you know, so big on the Bible? Why do you have to read the Bible? Right? Can't you just get in the club and do your own thing? And it's because scripture transforms our thinking, transforms us leads us, we listen to God, it transforms our thinking. Um, establishing what we call a biblical worldview, right? And with a biblical worldview, guess what? The founding fathers established a political system in America. Established a political system with three branches of government. Why? If you read their writings, because they understood with a biblical worldview that man is inherently evil. And if you, con if you concentrate power in the hands of one man, as they had lived under King George III, you have problems, right? God tried to tell his people, you don't want an earthly king. <laughs> you don't want an earthly king. No, 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 no. Don't, no. They, they said, oh, we want a king because all the other countries have a king. You don't want a king. He sent Samuel out, said, Samuel, tell him what a king's going to do. And Samuel went out and said, he's going to do this. He's going to take your sons and daughters. They're going to have to be servants. You're going to have to pay them a tax on top. He's going to go to war. He's going to call you a blah, blah, blah. And then they still said, we want a king. <laughs> we want to be like everybody else. So they gave him a king. So they, but our founding father said, no, 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 no. We, we need to spread government out. We're going to have three branches. And we're going to give them different responsibilities. And you know what? Every civilized country in the world has tried to emulate what our founding fathers did, okay? You know, problematic as they were, and, you know, they had their own sins like us, but you know what? They had a biblical worldview, and that's what they created the government upon. Thank the Lord. Yeah. <clears throat> but the development of a biblical worldview is no longer the norm in America or for American children. It's the exception. This is maybe the worst news today for our nation. Why are we having riots? Why, why so much dissension? A biblical worldview doesn't reign over our culture anymore. It's, it's marginalized. It's the exception. We've gone from the Scopes Monkey Trial in 1923 where a Tennessee high school science teacher was fired for teaching evolution Fast forward 100 years, and a university biology professor is refused tenure and fired for teaching not Christianity, but just divine design. That's where we are today. Our thinking has changed in America, and the only way back to God, to a God-honoring and nation-blessing biblical worldview, is apologetics and evangelism. That's the only way back. It's not legislation. What Augustine was doing in the 5th century while the Roman Empire crumbled from within 
because of pagan immorality based on pagan worldview is what the monastery system was originally designed to do during the Dark Ages. Stay with me here. I know your monastery, you think, golly, where's he going with this? Mm -hmm. Just listen. It's what it was originally designed to do during the Dark Ages. Do you know why it was called dark? Because the barbarians, really the Germanic tribes, doggone Germany, all the way back then was conquering everything. The Germanic tribes couldn't read. So guess what they did to all of the learning centers in the Roman Empire? They destroyed them. Burned all the books, destroyed them. The only learning centers left were in little old Ireland, where Patrick had planted churches in the 4th century, and they had started monasteries then. There's a great book I highly recommend to you called uh, How the Irish Saved Civilization, written by Thomas Cahill. Its premise is that the Irish um, came back across Europe after or during the Dark Ages. They sent 12 at a time. Columbo was the first. He lands in the Hebrides and western Scotland, and they they they, uh, they built a, a monastery right there where the kings of Scotland were all buried for the first um, 200 years, and then they came all the way back across, establishing monasteries, which were the centers of learning. Okay, I'm not talking about you know being a monk, but the local gentry sent their sons and uh, they didn't send their daughters there, but they sent their sons there to be educated, to learn to read and write and to learn a biblical worldview. The monasteries from the 6th century to the 12th century were the centers of learning in, in the Dark Ages, when the rest of culture had fallen apart. Today, and I think going forward, we will have monasteries, but they're called churches, Christian high schools, and Christian colleges. And we need to support them, and we need to... Um, you know, make sure they are centers of learning and establishing biblical worldview. Uh, now, it's not to say we abandon culture. You know, we're, we're still going to live and breathe daily in culture, wherever we're called to, wherever we live, our work. You know, we're going to try to send Christians into the general, but we need to make sure we have places where we're training um, our people to think God's thoughts after, after him. Let my people think. Give thanks that as a Christian, you can rejoice in the Lord and in his creative works. You can have communion with the living God anywhere, anytime, and fellowship with the Spirit through prayer. And that you can think God's thoughts after him and fix your eyes on Jesus in a crooked world. And these are the benefits and blessings that we can use to persuade non-Christians of the goodness of life under the Lordship of Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, we praise you um, that you're a rescuing God. We all needed rescuing, Lord. Wherever we were, wherever you found us, you lifted our, our heads and you spoke truth to us and you planted the seed of faith in us. And we thank you for that. We praise you for being a rescuing God. We thank you that as believers with your spirit, we can rejoice. Help us, Lord. We're complainers by nature. I know I am. Help us to rejoice, to pause, to count our blessings on a daily basis. And help us, Lord, to continually pray without ceasing. And, Lord, to think. To think and sharpen our minds and help our grandchildren and our children to think your thoughts after you. For, for our good, Lord, for our good, for this nation's good, and for your glory. We're praying that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, let's sing again. Fairest Lord Jesus, 88. Let's stand together.